All right, Jay, sir, this was this was very interesting. And we had we, we've talked to different atmospheric chemists before. And so it's yes, fun bringing on another atmospheric chemist and be able to talk to with him and to learn about in particular about the aerosols themselves. Yeah, if, we got to hear about how he defines aerosols or how aerosols are defined, you know, that they're um, lots, they, it's not necessarily their chemical composition, that it's more about the size and how long they hang around. And um, yeah, it was, it was very, and then the different types, some are natural types of aerosols. And then of course the man-made aerosols and implications of those. And that's, that's what I enjoyed here. That's what I really enjoyed hearing about was the, the fact that there are different types of aerosols and we, yeah. I mean, some of them are, are impacting like climate change and some of them are impacting like health, our own health. Right. And so I, I was glad he, I was glad he gave us a, a nice overview of that. Absolutely. So we have Professor Alexander Laskin, who's a professor of analytical chemistry at Purdue University joining us today. Welcome to Superheroes of Science. I'm Stephen. And I'm Sarah. We co-host Science from the Experts. Our guests are professionals doing cutting edge science right now. They're experts in their field discussing what they know best. So listen up and learn real science from real people. Subscribe now and stay informed of our latest episodes and show your support. Yeah, talking about the sources of uh, atmospheric aerosols, right? So uh, basically atmospheric aerosols, this is a tiny particles that uh, they are so small that they can float in the air, right? Yeah. And we're kind of, you know, quite familiar with the fact that, you know, our atmosphere is composed of different gases, but, um, you know, that uh, these tiny particles, aerosols are also like an inherent uh, part of the atmosphere is not it's not like of, uh, I would say, common sense. Well, in fact, it's everywhere, right? I mean, so, you know, when you, you know, see like dust, a uh, cloud of dust, you know, wind blown dust, that, that's the aerosol, right? So, and uh, some of the aerosols, they're completely uh, natural, like, uh, let's say, uh, ocean mist, okay? Mm -hmm. When you, you know, walk al along the uh, ocean or seashore, I mean, you can feel these small particles of, uh, of water, right? So this is aerosol, okay? You know, when you see event of, uh, let's say, wind-blown dust, this is also aerosol, and this is very natural aerosol. Then, of course, um, it's, uh, it's not that easily seen, but actually all our forests, I mean, they emit a lot of organic compounds that they oxidize in the atmosphere, and then they form tiny, tiny particles of uh, organic material. These are all completely natural uh, aerosols that you know existed, you know, as long as the Earth existed, right? And then, of course, uh, like um, the aerosols related to volcanic emissions. So these are quite harmful aerosols, and uh, let's say, in a way, unwanted aerosols. But this is also part of uh, the uh, like natural uh, sources on the planet. Right. So, and of course, I mean, once all these um, particles, they emit it in the aerosol, some of them, they're so small, they can stay days and months, you know, airborne. I mean, they can uh, interact with, with each other. They can uh, react with the gases. So they undergo very complex multi-phase chemistry. Now, what we did like, you know, with the industrial revolution and, you know, developments in the countries, so we added to these natural sources a lot of other particles, and uh, most of them, they're all related to consumption of uh, fossil fuels, basically generation of energy, you know, that is used either for transportation or for industry. And then we have um, these days endless forest fires, okay? And uh, even uh, home cooking, okay, or cooking in the large cities like street cooking in uh, cities like Mexico City or overpopulated um, cities in uh, developing countries, just cooking, you know, and the fumes from, um, from stoves, they also create quite a lot of uh, aerosol. You know, the other thing is also like occasional, um, like really disastrous events, like, you know, this is the explosion in Beirut um, last year. And something like that would emit tons of these uh, tiny particles that would impact the, uh, the environment like at the regional scale, okay? So these are the aerosols. I mean, this is what we study, okay? Now, 
when you take or capture those aerosols, right, and take a look at them uh, in the microscope, these are tiny particles. So, I mean, the, uh, the size bars here, I mean, this is like two micron uh, micrometers. So this is five. I mean, they're all, I mean, they're sub micrometers, they're nano size particles or nanometer size particles. Okay, and uh, in many cases, and especially in the complex environment, you cannot find two particles alike. Okay, so it's very, very diverse, um, um, you know, very complex mixture of particles that, you know, they have like uh, diversity between, let's say, individual different particles. And uh, there is a substantial heterogeneity in the composition of each particle. So the whole thing is quite complex. And uh, what we do, we find a way to just, you know, to unravel this complexity to some, you know, um, let's say, um, um, parameterized or uh, simplified cases that, you know, can be, uh, uh, can be um, like quantitatively assessed, if you will, or, you know, can provide some data for, let's say, for modelers. Okay, now, now the scale of all these things is really um, like, um, you know, could be uh, regional or planetary. Okay, so for instance, and this is just the satellite images. This is the wind blown dust from Sahara Desert. Okay, so this is the Africa, and this is, you can see the plume of this uh, dust particles over the ocean, right? And actually, Dust from Sahara arrives to Latin America and even to United States. Okay, so, and then this is the plume of uh, biomass burning smoke full of these particles that actually goes outside uh, of the, um, I mean, this is California, San Francisco, LA, goes all the way into the ocean and impacts uh, like climate, atmosphere, and then also deposits uh, into the ocean. So these are all consequences of that. And then here, it's not uh, well maybe seen, but I mean, this is like the plume or let's say the uh, polluted uh, air full of these aerosols uh, over the LA area on a bad day. So these are all events that have really um, like regional, at least regional uh, or large regional uh, effects. Now here is, for instance, this is the movie that just uh, kind of shows the circulation of air mass and the aerosols you know, around the globe. And what you can see, I mean, so this is the greenish area. This is the source of this uh, natural particles from the forested area. So the blue, these are the uh, sea spray particles. The brown is uh, mineral dust, all is blown from uh, Sahara and Saudi Arabia. And then white here, these are sulfate you know, related to industrial emissions. So what you can see here is that, I mean, they, they, I mean, they, you know, they, they emit it in different sources. But then, of course, they mix together and then coexist together. They react, they evolve, and uh, this is the subject of our study. Now, why we do need to care about that? So uh, this is what what I uh, well, I mean, I can uh, let me make this well. Anyhow, the thing is that uh, oh, first thing, I mean, these uh, particles, okay. They have, I mean, they control or in, in kind of um, yet not fully understand the manner, they control the uh, interaction of uh, atmosphere with uh, incoming solar light. Yeah. So these particles, they reflect light, okay, and that would be the cooling effect. These particles can absorb light, warm up, that would be warming effect. I mean, this is like the direct uh, effect on the uh, interaction with the uh, solar uh, with the incoming solar radiation and outgoing uh, thermal radiation from uh, from Earth. Mm -hmm. But now, more importantly, actually, that all the clouds that exist in the world, I mean, they're formed on these sky particles. So cloud is um, uh, basically is an ensemble of micro droplets. 
but those micro droplets, they condense on pre-existing particles, okay? Now, of course, I mean, before industrial revolution, we, we had clouds, we had rains and so on so, but all that was basically formed on completely natural sources of uh, particles. Now we disturb this uh, composition. Now we have completely different uh, composition of the aerosols in the atmosphere. Okay, that of course, as a consequence, impacts the uh, cloud cycles and hydrological related hydrological cycle. So, and at the core of how certain types of the uh, aerosols would impact, you know, positively or negatively, uh, uh, cooling or warming. It's all about the composition of this particle. So their physical chemistry dictates the, their interaction with light and their interaction with water. So, and uh, as a physical and analytical chemist, um, and my group is focused really on understanding of the uh, chemical transformations of these particles, their composition, their physical chemical properties, again, with, um, mostly with the applications to the uh, um, uh, to the predictive understanding of their impact on the atmospheric process. This is one part of the um, story. So the other part of this story is that all these particles, I mean, they can be also inhaled by us, okay? And to some of them, we are quite tolerant and uh, there is nothing wrong to inhale a little bit of sea salt. Right. To some of them, they, they could be uh, highly toxic, okay? And again, while my uh, group just, uh, it's not like the major focus of my group. I mean, this is uh, like in the community, this is a uh, like substantial uh, research topic. Talking about this particular time and this particular uh, you know, environment that we live on. In, right? So the um, COVID viruses, okay, or SARS disease, I mean, it's all transported by the uh, viruses that are 20, uh, 200 nanometers large. These are small aerosols, okay? Mm -hmm. So the, uh, let's say, infected person exhales them, okay? And then they start floating in the air, okay? And then they have certain uh, lifetime in the air when they can uh, affect other people. And um, as we go, we, uh, yeah, we, we may um, inhale these uh, viruses and that's how the infection uh, is transmitted. So in fact, I mean, you know, my group was not involved in uh, kind of in any uh, special research projects, but there is a, a you know, really large burst of, um, let's say, aerosol science and aerosol chemistry and physics uh, research in the last two years, basically related to the, uh, to the understanding of the COVID transmission and uh, the ways how to mitigate it. Mm -hmm. yeah, so are health effects the primary driver behind researching the aerosols or are there other scientific things that we're trying to discover through this? beyond health of humans? Well, I mean, the, uh, well, again, depending on, um, well, depends on uh, different, uh, let's say, um, uh, government agencies that, uh, that support the research, okay? So let's say health-related uh, agencies like NIH or EPA, and they would support more like health-focused uh, studies. But uh, DOE, NASA, NOAA, I mean, they're more interested in the climate-related um, uh, effects of aerosol. Okay. So it's, uh, and then of course, you know, there are also occupational effects of aerosols or in many uh, like, uh, let's say uh, fabrication facilities, there is like dust in the air that is very specific to, to the process that you know, um, that is used for the fabrication or whatever. And, um, and also there are, there are like wide industries that purposely generate 
um, so-called engineered nanoparticles that can be easily aerosolized and become airborne and stay in the air and contribute to all this uh, complex mixture. For instance, you know, all cosmetics that we use, like, you know, like uh, all kinds of pastes and uh, creams and so on, mm -hmm. uh, especially the sunscreen. Sunscreen, so what do you have? You have a gel of something, right? But then inside of that gel, there are tiny, tiny either zinc oxide or titanium oxide particles, okay? That are purposely generated, you know, for, you know, to do the sunscreening job. Okay, but uh, if uh, when they become dry and uh, you know, in certain conditions, they also can become uh, airborne. And once they're airborne, they're, they're very small and uh, they will remain airborne for a long, long time. So aerosols, are, are they confined to a certain size? Like, is it, is it, is an aerosol equal to like a certain size, I guess, or, or yes. are there? Yes, I mean, again, uh, generally speaking, okay, so we, with aerosols, anything, you know, any object smaller than uh, 10 micrometers, okay, would have some, some, some lifetime. So a particle of 10 micrometers, you know, would live maybe or would remain uh, airborne maybe for minutes or so okay. before it settles somewhere. But the particle of micron, one micron, micrometer size, okay, would remain airborne already for hours and days. Particles smaller than that, if we go to 100 nanometer, uh, nanometers particles, I mean, they would be airborne for, for days, weeks, months, okay? Mm -hmm. So single nano or like few nanometer particles, I mean, they basically, uh, they can stay uh, airborne forever. I see. Okay. So yeah, I mean, with aerosols, and of course, you know, the properties of them, they're highly, uh, um, they're strong function of their size. But smaller particle is more longer it remains airborne. For instance, you know, we like humans, you know, when inhale air, so any particle or particles then smaller than uh, 2.5 micrometers, okay, they actually can go into our lung system. Okay, so, and some of them, they, I mean, we can inhale them, some of them will be exhaled, but some of them, they will uh, arrive, you know, deep in the lungs and uh, then they can go into the bloodstream uh, stream and so on. So, but again, I mean, this is something that just think about it. It's, I mean, that's that's the way the nature is built. Okay, so I mean, lots of very natural and um, um, like common uh, aerosol particles that we live with it without any problem. We inhale them, exhale them, and um, no harm is made. Mm -hmm. Okay. But then like with many other things in the, in the nature and in the environment, when the humans heavily disbalance something, okay, then this is where problems would start. Uh, are they naturally without the human uh, impact that we have that we're, we're separating? Do the natural ones kind of balance each other out where some of them absorb energy, some of them reflect more? And is that where we get our natural balance within the climate itself because of that? And is that yes. what we're pushing off now? Yes. I mean, so again, with exception to, let's say, uh, uh, drastic events like, you know, like volcano eruptions, right? right. So uh, then things are kind of balanced by the mother nature. Okay, but then of course, you know, any major eruption without all what we've done in like uh, related to industrial activities or so on. So then um, any major eruption would kind of emit huge amount of this material into the atmosphere. And after that, it takes years before things, you know, start to level off again. Mm -hmm. And so the, the anthropologic, uh, impact on this where the humans are putting more aerosols into the atmosphere now how are we impacting that that natural balance that was there before well 
<laughs> that's where climate change come, comes from. Okay, so it's not only um, um, greenhouse gases. It's mm -hmm. a combination of uh, many, many different things uh, like working together. And actually uh, in this regard, um, let's say impact of aerosols is least understood. I'm okay. just like throwing things at you, I'm sorry. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Yeah, the thing is that okay. So we uh, yeah we all know about the uh, you know warming effect by uh, carbon dioxide, CO two, right? And you know there are some other greenhouse gases, but um, there is actually like really handful number of uh, gases, okay, that you know uh, act with this greenhouse effect, okay. And uh, in terms of their, uh, let's say, predictive understanding of their impact, um, there is a consensus and, and uh, there are numbers and you can uh, basically, you can correlate and uh, relate, let's say, uh, uh, certain levels of CO2 emissions, you know, with certain levels of the warm, okay? Now, the aerosols, because they are, I mean, so the, it's not single species. Okay, so that's the problem. So CO2 is a one single gas, okay, that you can analyze, you can um, you know, design some um, approaches for capturing and sequestration, right? So with aerosols, it's not a single gas, it's not a single component. I mean, these are particles of different sizes, of different chemical composition. And, uh, you know, some, some of these particles, they would scatter light and actually provide cooling effect, they would offset the uh, warming of climate. Some of these particles, they're heavily uh, absorbing light, okay? Those would add to CO2 warming effect, right? Mm -hmm. So, and then of course, uh, throughout the planet, I mean, they are, I mean, they're not homogeneously distributed. So in the middle of the ocean, you have one type of the uh, aerosols in the middle of uh, whatever in um, Indiana, there will be completely different uh, type of uh, aerosols and uh, aerosols in the middle of Indiana versus aerosols in, uh, in Chicago, they also will be drastically different. So in that regard, basically it's a way, way more complex system to understand and provide like really sophisticated, um, um, let's say knowledge-based um, parameterization or you know, predictive und understanding of their effects. So this is why so many groups are busy with this research. <laughs> are there places on in the world that are just naturally um, where it's not aerosols aren't don't pose as much of a danger to humans as other. I mean, are there like I, I've I've seen in like off the coast of California that that could be a particularly dangerous area, and then India could be a particularly um, dangerous dangerous area for aerosols. But are there other places similar to that, or are there places where aerosols don't seem to have much of an negative? Well, still I and mean, still there are you know there are remote areas, uh, but. I mean, the, the uh, like of forests and, um, and look, in many places still, I mean, there are, there are uh, certain areas um, in, um, let's say in the world and in the United States where uh, aerosols have, uh, le or let's say anthropogenic aerosols would have uh, less impact. But I mean, the, the size of these areas uh, shrinks all the time, that's, that's the reality. With the so, research that you're doing, what is your hope? Are you trying to prove or disprove with the research that you're doing on the aerosols or your group is doing? Well, it's not about proving something or it's really uh, like understanding, um, understanding the complexity of this uh, material and its impact. Now, um, well, it's like, uh, yeah, we do environmental chemistry research and uh, uh, let's put it this way. So the goal of our research is really provide fundamental understanding, okay? That fundamental understanding can be taken into, um, 
let's say, in, into or inform some engineered solutions or mitigation policies or uh, basically provide uh, ideas or something, you know, how, how to make our world better. And of course, I mean, we advocate for, um, for our findings and you know, like findings um, and, um, and basically, yeah, try to make um, our world a little bit better. Mm -hmm. But of course, I mean, it's, um, it's not just up to one group or even it's, it's, it's really, uh, um, let's say, um, multi, um, knowledge area effort um, to, to provide real world uh, solutions. We, we, I mean, we in, in university, we, we do uh, love to discover fundamental processes, but then those fundamental processes and knowledge and so on should inform some uh, uh, practical engineered or political decisions. Sure. I like that. How do you say so you're researching the aerosols, but how are you collecting them? Is, is there a pick particular, are there different methods of aerosol collection? I know oh, yeah. I have like a purple air uh, aerosol thing in my backyard that uh, I look at every once in a while to see the air quality index, but I'm guessing yours is a little more complicated than that. Well, Again, uh, talking about my group, yeah, we do collect uh, aerosols and, you know, the simplest uh, way to collect it, I mean, you can think about just filtering it, right? So um, when you open your vacuum cleaner, like this nasty bag, right? So this is a filtered aerosol in a way. Right. So, and of course, I mean, yeah, I mean, I mean this is kind of uh, exaggerated or like, you know, really uh, most basic uh, uh, example, but yeah, I mean, there are some uh, way more sophisticated uh, devices that would uh, collect particles of certain size. Um, it's, 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 it's never one technique. It's a combination of different techniques because, uh, yeah, they're all shaped for certain size of particles. So you need to work harder to collect smaller particles. Mm -hmm. And the task of collecting uh, large dust, like the one in the vacuum cleaner, that, that task is trivial, okay? But then uh, there are also uh, groups and techniques and approaches that can analyze aerosol on fly without collecting, uh, let's say, uh, on, on some filter or on some uh, substrate. Oh, wow. So there are techniques that uh, that basically detect and analyze uh, aerosols uh, just you know from the uh, from their uh, native airborne uh, uh, environment. Mm -hmm. oh, very nice. You have, is there an area where you you narrow your research to, like like you go to a certain place in the world to to get those samples, or or is it just where you are now, or well, okay. Uh, so I've been in this uh, work for a long time. Okay. So, and these are the yellow stars. These are um, the places where one way or another, my group and my associates, uh, they went there you know, and brought some samples. Okay. So the uh, red stars, these are kind of our planned studies for foreseen future. Okay, so yeah, I mean, we, we, we go places. All over the world. All over the world. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, but of course, you know, it's easier to travel within the United States, right? So, mm -hmm. now, the density. If, when we talk to and a of geologist, course, they'll take, like, huh? they'll find, if it, we talk to a geologist, they go on vacation and they collect rocks and they take them home. Do you collect air samples? <laughs> Not on vacation. <laughs> <laughs> I, I just thought I'd ask. <laughs> That's a fair no. question. <laughs> no, not, not on vacation. So we, we do collect, well, I mean, we use all kinds of opportunities to collect aerosols, but it's, well, because we still need to bring something, okay? So um, we cannot collect like by hands, 
mm -hmm. ISOs. We need some um, some devices. So usually, uh, yeah, vacation is vacation. You know, travel for field work is travel for field work. Got it. All right. <laughs> <laughs> but the truth is that you know sometimes you know quite often we combine this uh, especially when we go to some you know previously uh, unvisited places yeah we, we combine we would take a few days off just to see you know to go for sightseeing and uh, yeah yeah that's that's a really nice part of, of field research is you do get to see more places and that's something when <laughs> I came for I never realized at first that it, I mean it's I'm in Earth Atmospheric Planetary over here, and so it's they all do field work, and so yeah, they get to see the entire world as part of their job, which is really cool. Mm -hmm. Very nice. Well, thank you. This this was this was a really good overview. We appreciate that, and uh, yes. I like this. It's it's amazing how many different places you've you've done research. Yeah, I know. I I was kind of lining it up with um, the map you saw earlier with the animation, and it looks like. Well, I see some kind of, it looks like in the middle of the ocean and um, some No, it's not middle of the ocean. These are Azores. There were what? Azores. I mean, there is a group of islands in the middle of the Atlantic oh. Ocean. It's like like Hawaii, but in, in oh, the middle of the Atlantic. Oh my goodness. Well, yeah, well then, so it looks like you had potential to collect some different types of aerosols then from the different places where you work. Well, I need to uh, say that not in every single place here I was personally, okay, so, but there was somebody, uh, you know, from my group yeah. who went there. Very well, that'd be a rough one, going to remote tropical island, uh, do some research. Oh, man. <laughs> you need someone to help. <laughs> yeah. yeah. <laughs> we always look for, for motivated students. Yep. Well, this is awesome. Thank you very much yes. for taking time to, uh, yes. to share your research and adventures with us. We appreciate this immensely. Yes. Thank you for listening to this episode of Science from the Experts from Purdue University Superheroes of Science. If you like this episode, subscribe, give us a positive view, and share the love. Boiler up! Hammer down! <laughs>